Welcome the founder and host of BuddyCast, Nick Sorensen. Hello, buddies. It's time for another episode of everybody's favorite show, BuddyCast. I'm your host, Nick Sorensen, and joining me today is a very special buddy. I met him at Erie Comic Con. A shout out to Erie Promotions for putting us together, making this all possible. My buddy, Sonny Straight. How you doing, Sonny? Really good. How are you, Nick? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for stopping on the show again. Absolutely. So, Sonny, like your uh, theme song. Where did that come from? That's actually a local artist named Tommy Link. He, I needed a theme song in the beginning to warm up the guests, give them the feel good energy that this show is going to be producing. And someone connected me with him and he played the first three notes. And I'm like, that's what I'm looking for. So, we just came up with like the lyrics because this show was created during the pandemic when everything was going nutty. Everyone was just down on their luck. Just, you know, you greet someone with a handshake. Hey, or you greet someone. Hey, how's it going? And they tell you to go do something unholy, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I thought this world's kind of nutty. This world's kind of like getting cruddy. We just, we need, we need something like buddy cast to get us back in the groove. And you that's need what some nutty buddies. Exactly. So, Sony, you're a very, very, very good voiceover actor, but you had to start from somewhere. Some would say I'm very, 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 very good. Even that. But you had to start from somewhere. Where did your beginning start? How did this journey begin? Oh, well, it has to go back to when I was four years old. Um, My father did impressions of cartoon characters just for fun. And when I was four, he taught me how to do Donald Duck. And... Okay, so what's that? He said, uh, okay, well, how about Mickey Mouse? And he started doing his other voices for me. And by the time I was 10, I started making a list of all the voices I could do. I could do about 100 voices when I was 10 years old. And I thought, oh, it'd be so cool to be a cartoon voice actor. But that happens in L.A. and in New York. And I lived in Texas. And I didn't really plan on leaving the state as a child. It just didn't seem like a possible dream to me. It just seemed like a nice fantasy. But then I got into high school theater again because of my dad. He he uh, he talked me into going. I, I was born in a raised in a town that was kind of um, kind of a big old hick town. You know, it's like they have the world's biggest rodeo in Mesquite, Texas. And um, guys who were uh, into the arts tended to be picked on quite a bit. Right. Mm. And so I was kind of, I wanted to take theater, but I was afraid of, you know, getting my ass kicked. But my dad, he was like the toughest biker dude you could ever meet. He looks like Popeye. It was like a combination of Master Roshi meets Popeye. And he's got these big old forearms and stuff. And I remember he asked me what I was taking in high school. And I said, well, I'll be taking band again because that was safe. And I was already in band. And he said, well, you know, you ought to take theater, son. You know, you're such a clown. You'd probably be pretty good at it. So I got into theater and found out that I was actually pretty good at it. And I started winning a lot of awards. And my plan was to go to college, uh, get a, become a theater professor and get tenure and just, you know, live for theater for the rest of my life. But when I got into college, um, I dropped out of four different colleges. Uh, I was a bit of a punk. And then I was, I finally settled at UNT. I was on, uh, there on a scholarship and uh, I was also, I started drawing comics at that time. And I had drawn a couple of comics for the uh, school newspaper in high school and college uh, for two different colleges. But then um, I met a guy who was drawing his own comic books and I started drawing comic books with him and we got a story published. And when that happened, I just dropped out of college and focus on comics for about 10 years. But then I started getting the acting bug again when I was about 32. Uh, and I started acting in a lot of community theater. 
And then Funimation moved to Texas and they had open auditions for Dragon Ball Z. And I went, oh, my God, I did not expect to get a part because I'd never done a cartoon. But, you know, I love cartoons. And since I was a little kid, I just wanted to audition. I thought it'd be fun to do funny voices on a mic, you know, and not expecting it apart. But um, after my audition, I auditioned for every character. But it was weird in my auditions. They gave us a, like uh, these folders because we uh, I don't know if you know this Ocean Group did the recordings, first English recordings in Canada. And so they wanted us to try to sound like the Canadian version. And Krillin was not in my folder. He was on a video. We, they left us alone. We could watch the video alone, get to know the characters and come up with voices. It was a really interesting audition. But Krillin wasn't in the folder, so I just assumed he'd been cast. And then I went to audition in front of uh, Barry Watson and Chris Sabat was the assistant director at that time. And they, I did all these different voices. And then they said, OK, can you do Krillin? And I went oh wait is that the bald guy and they said yes yeah. he wasn't in the folder so i just I ignored him i don't even know what he sounds like and they said well he's just kind of nasally you know and kind of scratchy and i just did something i have no idea what i did but then i get a call a week later from chris sabbat and he said hey um we think that you're a better actor but there's another guy who could do krillin's voice better and I said, well, do you remember I told you at the audition that I didn't even listen to it because I thought it had been cast? And he said, oh, OK, well, why don't we do this? Let's bring the both of you back. You can both listen again and then we'll have another audition with the two of you. So once I listened to it, I was like, oh, it's something like this. Hey, everybody, wait up. You know, and I could I nailed it. Right. Uh, so I, I got it because I could mock Terry Clausen pretty well. Uh, but then the first day of recording, Barry Watson uh, said, uh, he's a good old boy from Texas. And he said, hey, dude, that, I mean, Krillin's a little guy, but he, you know, he's the world's toughest human being. Can you make a tougher sound? Because I hate that voice. And I was like, oh, okay, tough little guy. I, and I had, when I read the manga at this point, and in my head, Krillin sounded like Popeye on helium, you know? And uh, so I said, what about like Popeye on helium? He goes, what would that sound like? I don't know, something like this? Come on, guys, let's go. He went, yeah, yeah, use that. So I got, that's how I got into the business. But at this time, I didn't take it seriously because there was not a lot of studios doing this, right? And Funimation just had this one show and I figured it would last about two years and then I'd be over and it'd be kind of cool because I was on TV for a minute. But as soon as we started recording, they started sending in the, the episodes to Cartoon Network. They were still showing the Canadian version, right? But they had seen our version. And they really liked what me and Linda Chambers and Chris Sabat were doing. Um, and so they did a nationwide audition for Toonami Tom. And they were using all the studios. And from our studio, they picked Linda and me and Chris Sabat. And so... I auditioned for Toonami Tom and I got the part. And what was weird was I was announcing Dragon Ball Z, but it was the Canadian cast. So it was very weird being Toonami Tom. And so my first real appearance, even though Krillin is my first part, my first appearance on TV was Toonami Tom. And once I got that, I just thought, you know what? Maybe I've stumbled onto a career here. And it's been uh, dominating my life for the past 24 years. Wow. And that's a long answer, but that's how I how I got into yeah. it. Yeah. And do you remember like the early roles of Krillin, like the early, you know, how he evolved throughout your character, like how you evolved him in the mm -hmm. way throughout the years. Yeah, the thing is a lot of us, I mean, you what a lot of people don't realize is that you have to be a really good actor to sound halfway decent dubbing, right? Because the mouth flaps are already set for you, right? Um so for a lot for us, you know, we're all green to this. You know, a lot of people came from theater and I think Chris Abbott came from opera and radio. Um, so performing was not hard for us, but it was getting a, a natural read with those flaps. And I remember very early on when we started getting some more shows, um, me, I think Mike was the next director. And then I was right after Mike, like two months after him. And Chris Sabat was the head director at this point, And he called us into a meeting and he said, um, I want our goal to be to sound as if we're prelay, meaning 
they recorded us first and animated to our voices, right? He says, I want it to look that good. And so that was our goal at that time. And I was like, that's a that's a good standard to set, right? And so we all worked really, really hard. And by the time we got to Full Metal Alchemist, um, we're winning awards, you know? Suddenly we went from the bane of anime to being its champion. Um, and it was really cool to see that development, but it was really because of a lot of hard work and and I, I got to give Chris Sabat a lot of credit. It was from his leadership. You know, we took a lot of cues and and he was in an interesting situation. He trained himself to be a super dubber because out of necessity, because they hired him to be the director because he was also could do a lot of voices. And, you know, he was getting salary. So he was getting paid the same crappy money every week, no matter how many voices he did. So he was working like, you know, 12 hours a day doing tons of voices and getting so good at it, you know, and so fast at it. And then finally, he said, you know what? He told Funimation, I want to go to contract. And he went, well, you're not going to get any benefits. He goes, eh, it's all right. I'll just take the, the $50 an hour, which is what we're getting paid at the time. And he was getting $50 an hour working 12 hours a day. And suddenly he's banking. And then he took that money and invested it into his own studio which started getting a lot of Funimation's overflow, and video games, and Ocatron 5000 just took off. So there's a guy who played the long game and really well, you know. But again, he when he took over the reins at Funimation, the quality went way up. And mm. then the next step in quality was, I'd have to give it to Justin Cook, uh, when he did Fruits Basket. Uh, Fruits Basket... We all thought Justin was insane the way he was directing us because he was trying to get that tonal quality that that show has. And we were always told at the time to Americanize everything, you know, but um, and luckily a lot of the shows kind of had an Americanized quality anyway. But this did not. Fruits Basket is not Americanized. And he wanted to get that tone. And I remember he saw me in a convention. He said, have you seen Fruits Basket yet? And I went nah, I don't think it's really my kind of anime. And he goes, oh yeah, hang on. And he brought me a stack and it was still, I think, VHS. And he said, here, I want you to take these home and I want you to watch them. And I said, all right. And he wasn't, he was just a director at that time. I was a director at the time. He wasn't a producer. He wasn't giving me an order, but he just said, you need to watch this. And so I said, okay. And I went back and I watched it with my wife and daughter. We watched the entire series and we were blown away. And then me and the other directors were talking about it. It's like, man, that's, he's really accomplished something interesting here, right? He's by staying true to the Japanese intention on every line, you know? And then we were called into a meeting of directors and I noticed that Justin wasn't there and we were like, where's Justin, you know? And um, somebody came in and said, well, no, he's, he's the reason we're having this meeting. Um, our goal here is to Americanize these shows, right? And this is how we are not to do things, right? Well, I think it was like two months later, the reviews came out for Fruits Basket and everyone loved it. It was like just taken off. And I think it might've been a, just a year later, Justin was made head producer of production. So it's good though, that they saw that they said, okay, you know what? We were wrong. You know, Justin, you were right. Um, and to make it up for you, tell us how to do the next stage. And when Justin took over as producer, the quality went way up because he knew every job. He was an engineer. He was a director. He was an actor. So he knew our needs. So it wasn't hard. We didn't, it was, you know, it wasn't difficult to explain to him any issues we were having because he knew them all or he knew he, if he didn't, he would find a solution, you know? Mm -hmm. Isn't it so great having that, a boss like that too? Having a boss yeah. that knows every one of your roles. It's not just someone who maybe likes this department better than this department because that's where they came from. It's everything you know right there. Yeah, and I I directed for about three or four years, I think, and then I got a, a, a book published at Tokyo Pop. And so I started focusing more on drawing. And that went for several years, and I did a few uh, ElfQuest projects as well. And then... Um, they asked me if I wanted to come back to direct. And by this time I was making considerably more money on my own instead of directing and directing is a big commitment of time. And so I said, I just, I don't think I can afford to work as director. And um, they said, no, 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 we, 
we negotiate contracts now and it's not the set standard and it's and we pay more than we used to and so we had a little meeting and, and it was actually you know oh good we were actually stepping up that was cool and so i agreed to work there and um i remember um we we're it was a show called uh rage of the bahamut hmm. and it's really good and it's so it was just to advertise a a kid's card game, I think, right? But somebody loved this. They must have had so much back material. It's one of the best written, best animated animes I've ever seen. But the lead character was very Lupin the Third-ish, you know? And I played Lupin a lot, like for nine movies and also in the, the series, the Fujiko Mine series. So I was looking for somebody who could do that, you know? And I had aud auditions. I saw a hundred people. And nobody could get that. And I went to Justin and I said, Justin, I don't, I don't see, I'm, I'm going to have to play this part myself. I'm going to have to direct it myself. I don't want to, but I'm going to have to. And he said, uh, really, what are you looking for? I said, well, it's got to be like, it's got to be like a smarmy kind of guy, you know, who's just got a sense of humor, but also a heart of gold, you know, underneath. And, and, and nobody's nailing that Lupin quality. And he said, uh, have you heard Ian Sinclair? uh on uh space dandy and i went no and then so he said hang on and so he pulled up uh youtube and i heard two lines of ian sinclair and i went can you please ask if he's available that's perfect that is exactly what i'm looking for and as a matter of fact it's better than what i'm looking for when i heard him play the part when i cast him and put him into it um he was giving things that i would not have done you know and i'm just like this is this is an Ian part, you know, Ian and I are very similar actors in some ways, but in some ways I'm more suited to some parts and he's more suited to this. And I found out doing this one, he's more suited to this part. And it, it was so fun working with him. And Ian's such a theater nerd that he and I will get into theories of acting and stuff like that. And he'll come out of the booth and sit down and we'd be like, just having these debates and stuff. And I was like, okay, that's great. Now let's apply that, what we just talked about. And he goes, oh, cool. And he runs back in the booth and applies it. Uh, so my point in the whole long story was to say that Justin is a great go-to guy. You know, if you have any troubles casting or, or even just like um, promotion and things like that, he's the guy to talk to. That is truly an awesome story. That was, like I said, I love how you have a boss who, or you had a boss who knew, everyone's role who knew everyone and was willing to help them not just you should know your part better or something but was willing to hear your ideas too was willing to hear more ideas or spread ideas onto the table it really makes a difference when they've done what you've done mm -hmm. right it you, there's a lot of explaining you don't have to do because they're already there you know mm -hmm. uh you just gotta say what's the problem and they know it um Bingo. and i always tell a lot of my students that if you want to get into the business, one of the ways to get in is to become an engineer because mm -hmm. they do promote engineers to directors and actors and things like that. Like I think three of the main producers were directors and actors, you know, wow. and they came, Oh no, it came from fucking from engineering. Um, so uh, like uh, Ju uh, Zach uh, Bolton came from engineering uh, and Justin came from engineering. Uh, it, it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is probably like an open-ended question or like the million-dollar question, but throughout all your roles, through Dragon Ball Z and everything, which one would you say you had the most fun with on production? I've had a lot of fun with a lot of these roles. I mean, I tend to get cast in fun roles. Uh, it's That's one great thing about being a character actor is that you tend to get the fun and funny stuff. But my overall favorite has to be uh, Koro Sensei. Yes. In the assassination classroom. First of all, he's closer to my boy. He's like, he's in this area here, a little bit, a little bit smarmy, a little bit, a little bit more, a uh, little bit uh, looser too. But uh, he's so fun to play. And weirdly, I started teaching voice acting the same week I was cast as uh, Koro Sensei. And I strain, I guess, because there's certain processes that all teaching must go through. But I would find myself saying things as Koro that I just said in class the week before. So it was this weird art in imitating life situation. And uh, one of the students, uh, Kristen McGuire uh, from my class, was also one of the students on the on uh, Sashination Classroom. And it was her first named role. 
So it was just really fun. And, and she and I are, are really close friends, too. It's also one of the few parts I didn't have to audition for. Mm. I just showed up and I thought I was doing one piece um, because the director also did one piece. And then uh, he said, uh, and so I said, what is this? This isn't one piece. He goes, no, it's a new show. I went, oh, cool. Um, what is this? It's Assassination Classroom. And I, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. That's that's really popular all over the place. And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, what part am I playing? He goes, well, you're playing the lead. But what? <laughs> you could have given me a heads up. I would have researched the hell out of this, uh, at least read the manga. But he said, well, no, I think you'll get it. I, I cast you because it's very you. And I said, okay. And so I, I started watching like four lines into it. And I'm like, oh, I, I get him. I like him. I know exactly. And, and then I'm explaining to the directors what he's trying to do because I get this guy really well. So, yeah, yeah I love that character. That's my absolute favorite. Mm -hmm. Is he the one you relate to the most or is there another one that you would say you relate to? Well, I relate as a, some some actors approach everything as technique mm -hmm. and some actors like to um, put themselves into every character. So I relate even to people I can't stand. I will relate to them um, just to give a more convincing read. Nice. nice. Sometimes you feel, though, you got to have a little bit of an exorcism to get them out of you. Mm -hmm. Like you, like I remember I was playing this really skeevy guy uh, and it was just, I was just walking in the hallway of Funimation and Chris Bevan said, Hey, Sonny, I need you for a part real quick. And I went, okay, which we did all the time, you know, just throw if we're, we grab a director and say, grab this line. Um, but there was a scene of this guy buying soiled panties from a soiled panty store. And I'm like, first of all, I didn't know those existed. I don't know what you do with soiled panties. I mean, maybe you make soup. I don't know. It's gross. And he was disgusting, his despicable worm character. And I think the thing that bothered me the most about playing that part was it didn't bother me at all. It's just like, oh, okay, it's 50 bucks, it's 50 bucks, and moved on. You know, <laughs> that was the end of it. But so that was uh, the, book of the money. But at the same time, even with that, you got to put yourself in there. You got to say, okay, how would I sound? I always tell my students, don't think about how you say a line but think about why you're saying a line except when you look at the character for the very first time i want you to think how would i sound talking through that physicality through that body through that shape of face that that if he's got a long nose does that change things you know uh how would i sound like there's a character i play in a show called uh prison school not recommended for children mm -hmm. um but uh, there's a character named Andre who people try to accuse me of trying to sound like Smeagol. I was not. I never try to sound like anything. The only thing I try to sound like is me talking through that body. And Andre has this giant head, you know, and a very tiny face in the center of it. So I put myself in this, and he's probably about 800 pounds. So he's got to breathe heavier, right? But he's also got a tiny little esophagus, which is going to tighten things up very much. And he's also kind of skeevy. So he almost sounds like meat rod. You know, but I was not trying to sound like anyone. I never try to sound like anyone. I just try to think, what would I sound like talking through that? And after that, my only consideration is, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to hurt someone? Would I say this line? Am I trying to reach someone? Am I trying to preach? Am I trying to teach? Am I trying to, to hold somebody back? You know, what am I trying to do with that line? And that's my only consideration. Once I've got the voice of how I would sound in that body, that no longer matters. It's all about what I'm trying to accomplish with the line. That's awesome. And that's how you create a new character, correct? Like that's how you, if someone hands you just a script or, you know, your agent calls and says, hey, I got a new role for you, something mm -hmm. like that. And you're just, this is your first blind read. This is your first, you know, take, that's how you create the new voice, correct? Yeah. Like, um, the, and even like, they'll send you like a picture of the character if mm -hmm. they don't send you a video. Uh, and so if you look at the picture and you go, okay, how would I talk through that? You're going to have a pretty convincing sounding voice for that body, right? And I don't mm -hmm. even think about, how he would sound, I think how I would sound, right? Because it automatically gives me a sense of empathy for this thing that otherwise I would not feel connected to. 
and I want I I want to put. That's why a lot of times people say, yeah, I can hear a little bit of Krillin in that one, and I can hear a little bit of of Maze Hughes in that voice because I put all of me in every character. That's awesome. What about you? Also mentioned earlier, you do or you do coaching. You do you teach voice acting. Do you still do that today, by chance? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't do it as often, but I've got a class coming up in January. Uh, if you go to sunnystraightstudios.com, I think I've got five spots still open for that one. Um, and so I'm, it, I've started doing a lot more conventions lately, so I've had to pull back a little bit on the teaching, but I love teaching. As I said, I set out to be a teacher. I wanted to be a theater professor. Um this is much better, though, because I do it on my time and my terms. You know, I don't have to try to fit anyone else's curriculum. I just hit what I know they need to learn. And honestly, in my students now, about 50 percent of them are getting work in the anime field. Wow. And it is remarkable because I, when I started, I remember the engineer I worked with said he was worried that well, what if nobody gets any work from this? I went. It's not our job to make sure they get work. Our job is to give them the ability to act and then it can do whatever they want with it. And I thought maybe because I was doing one every other month, I thought maybe one or two students will get a job, you know, or get to work in this industry per year, you know, but I noticed pretty quickly it was more like 10 to 15 percent. And then it was like 20 to 30 percent, you know. And then when I switched to teaching online because of the pandemic, which I thought would actually hurt their acting abilities, um, it helped. And I re it took me a long time to figure out why. But then I realized, oh, they're not afraid to take chances because they're in their own living room. You know, mm -hmm. they don't are their own bedroom. They, they're not in front of they're not actually in front of people. So they're, they're digging deeper than they would have in person. And when it's in person, you only only people are going to make it in those classes are the people who have balls. You know, the people are just really willing. They don't give a shit that they're so, sorry about my language. They don't give a crap. No, you're that good, they're you're surrounded, good. surrounded by other people, you know, but there's a lot of people who feel insecure about that. Right. But online, there are more people who who are, have talent that you would never see because they're they feel more comfortable. It's just like all these um, YouTube shows and stuff like that. A lot of these people they would never stand on stage in front of an audience and stuff like that, but they can get comfortable in front of a camera and act that way. And then once they get to that point, then they're, they get more courage and then they're able to step into an audition and step into a recording booth and record because they've already proven to themselves they can do the job. Now they just have to get over their nerves and do it in front of other people. But mm -hmm. I'm, I've been amazed at how many students are actually getting work. Another thing that helps them get work is the fact that there's a lot of work. I told you when I started out, we, Funimation just had Dragon Ball Z. But now Crunchyroll is getting over 20 shows every three months, new shows. That's a lot of content and they need actors desperately. So if you're trained at this and you're good at it, you could probably find work because there's tons of work out there. Have you ever taken like a, a rookie who has zero experience and turned them into a star student? done better than that. I've had a student that had a lot of times students will ask me, do you think I have what it takes? And I go, I would never tell you. I think you have what it takes if you pursue it hard enough. But I had one student early on who had a, a severe learning disability, right? Mm -hmm. But he was really wanted to do this. And he took my basic class. This is what I was teaching in person. Mm -hmm. And then he took my advanced class. And when I had a studio, uh, I let my advanced students have the studio every Wednesday night to do whatever they wanted. And they were making plays. They were doing movies. They would, if they had nothing to do, they would do improv exercises for three or four hours. And he showed up every week. And I noticed that he just kept getting better and better and better and better. And recently he won an award. I'm not going to name wow. who he is or whatever, but I was amazed. So I, I would never tell anyone and I really can't stand it when I hear stories that that some teacher told them they would never be able to do this. Like, who the hell are you to tell somebody they can't do something? To me, that just says more about you than them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've heard that even from people like like professional directors I've worked with. that They they told me that their theater teacher said that you really don't have what it takes to make in this industry or whatever. I'm like, 
and yet here you are, you know? Mm -hmm. That's to me, that saying right there is motivation. That saying right there is whenever someone tells you you can't do something, that's just the gateway for you to say, watch me, you know? Mm -hmm. Like perseverance is so key in this. Yes. For example, I was like, my first job out of college was a sales job for two months. I was let go because I was, uh, because of my sales standing this past month, I think I just sold about close to $40,000 in furniture from my new job. So very nice. And I look at, and I look at what I've done with this show, you know, with all the guests that I've sold on this show alone that I've given you when we met at Comic-Con, you know, Mm -hmm. I sold you on the show, obviously. So, yeah. Well, and you were telling me about you had just gotten that job, so it's good to hear that you've actually doing so well. And do you get commission for that? I will. Yep. Nice. Nice. Yep. So, hey, speaking of Erie Comic Con, you were there recently. Mm-hmm. What, what? How? How was that show? How was that appearance for you? I loved it. Um, I, I told my agent because um, generally the conventions I get booked are really large conventions, and this is a much mm-hmm. smaller convention. Um, but I said, you know, you can start giving me more of these small commitments because what I like about it is that you got more one on one time with with the people who, who are in line when you when you do it like at a major convention, it's fun. It's exciting, you know, and you got hundreds of people waiting to in line for you, but you don't have a lot of time to spend with them. You know, you basically mm-hmm. go, hey, welcome. Hope you're having a good time and, you know, sign up. But when you're uh, at a smaller con, you can just sit there and talk to them for as long as you want you know? And Mm -hmm. as I said, I came from a theater background. So I was used to being on stage and getting response, you know, from people. And, and when you're recording in a booth, you don't get response, you know, you get the director who's trying really hard not to respond. So he doesn't mess up your take. Um, So hearing what people like about it, what they don't like about it is, uh, is incredible. And when you're in a smaller convention like that one, you get a lot more. And the people in Erie were just so sweet and accommodating. I, I loved it. That was awesome. Hey, I heard you had a good handler too. Yes, I did. Had several good handlers, actually. Nice. Our buddy yeah. Allie says hi, by the way. Love Allie. She's great. Yes. So that brings up and my her next mother. Question. Yes. That brings up my next question. Do you have any upcoming appearances, whether it be Tell, uh, TV shows or comic cons. Yeah, um, we're still recording uh, My Hero Academia, and I'm playing Redestro on that. And uh, of course, we're still doing One Piece, and we got the One Piece movie red that's coming out this Friday. Um, and theaters everywhere. Get your tickets today. Although I don't know when this will air, so maybe you know, maybe it did really well. <laughs> Let's hope it, it did. Actually, I actually don't hope you don't mind. We're live. We're Oh, we're live. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and also, let's see. Um, I'm going to be in England at Birmingham Comic Con uh, next week, next weekend. Nice. And then I th- early December, I'm going to be in LA Comic Con. So, yeah, I've got quite a thing showing up. That is awesome. From these shows, from these appearances at Comic-Con, have there ever been any really touching fan encounters that you've had that you can tell us about? Just uh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're meeting thousands of people, um, you're going to hear a lot of interesting stories. I remember one time I was at um, a Dallas convention. I think it was Akon. And um, this guy came over to me and he told me he was a, a soldier and he was in uh, Afghanistan. And he was, uh, he said he and his buddy, they would watch a lot of Dragon Ball Z, you know, and they, he said, we related to Krillin because we felt scared to death, you know, and yet we still had to do what we had to do, you know? So I said, well, that's cool. And he said, yeah, um, but my buddy, he didn't make it. And Mm -hmm. um, so when you sign this, I'm going to put it on his grave. And I was like, Oh my God. And so I just came around the table and gave him a big hug. And I said, "Um, uh, thank you for your service. I just, I cannot, I can't comprehend what you're going through, um, but thank you. And um, there's been a lot of touching moments like that. A lot of weird moments too. Very weird moments. I was about Especially to say, what about Australia? The, yeah. What about the funniest experience, um, encounter you've probably had? 
I don't know if it's you can add audio funny. appropriate, of course. Yeah. Well, let's see. Is this appropriate? A girl flashed me in a swimming pool once because she said it's Mace Hughes. <laughs> Is that appropriate? <laughs> we'll go with it. We'll go okay. with it. I was like, what the heck? And then I was like, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. And she did it again. Um, <laughs> and she had a friend in the pool next to her, and she he was like going. <gasps> I said, you've never yeah. seen this side of your friend before, have you? And he goes, and I said, son, you owe me. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. So from all of the roles, from all the things you've played, what are some of your greatest memories? You mentioned a really good memory before from having a great director. What are some of the greatest memories you've made throughout these shows? Usually it's when um, I make a really big connection to the character um like one of the biggest moments for me with krillin was when he had the device that could shut down the androids the button and uh -huh. he was having this existential crisis in his head because he and he finally just steps on it because he can't destroy android 18 because he's already in love with her well <clears throat> up until that point i was still you know matching mouth flaps you know and stuff like this but there was this time all of, he had paragraphs of lines but they were all in his head so I didn't have to match the mouth flaps. I could just read it any way I wanted to. And when I was just able to let go and get into that moment, I suddenly just, it just clicked with me. Like who he is, not just on just a deep level, like at his soul, I connected with Krillin. And I realized, oh, he's just a sucker for love. I get that. I went through that my, you know, most of my life, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I totally related to him there. And then I remember one time with Usopp, uh, it was during the Water 7 story arc, and he gets beaten up and has all the crew's money is stolen because he was carrying it, and he's humiliated, and he's angry, he feels like he is not um, up to this job, you know, and he's crying. And, and while I was recording him, I had tears were just running down my face, and I was like, that's, that's never happened to me before, you know? And suddenly I was like, this is, this is my favorite character. And he was my favorite character, until Koro Sensei came along. That's but yeah, awesome. those those moments happen a lot, and especially on these shows that last a long time, and you try to grab on quick because you gotta be that character from day one. And if you allow yourself, like I said, just to wear this cartoon suit and talk through it and relate to it, you can be very convincing and you can actually feel who this guy is, right? But if you've got these really long shows like Dragon Ball Z and One Piece and even like Full Metal Alchemist, which is two whole seasons, and then there are moments that you go, oh, I understand this guy really well, you know, and you almost feel like you're wandering around the cartoonist's head, you know, and feeling what he felt when he created this. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, I ask this to all voice actors who come on the show. You think you could do a little freestyling for us? Just run through like all, the, all your voices that you know and just do uh, some I'm a dumb, I'm a, you assume I'm a human. What I got to do to get it through to you? I'm superhuman, innovative, man of rubber, whatever you say, Rick, show me and glue to you. I'm devastating more than ever, demonstrating how to give them up. I'm going to get this if he likes. I, I had to stop because there's actually profanity there. Um, <laughs> there's Krillin rapping as uh, Rap God. Uh, let's see. What would Usopp do? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, that my Krillin voice is the same as my Usopp voice, but it's not. See, Krillin talks like this, and I can do this all day, right? But Usopp talks like that with a hitch in his voice, and that hitch hurts. So it's a different voice. I wish it was the same voice. I, I would some I would just love just to do the same voice for both of them, but I've already established something, and I have to stick with it. Uh, who are the characters that I do? I, oh, I'll tell you this. Now, Maze Hughes is... And also Lupin the Third, and also Koro Sensei are all basically the same voice, and they're all right up in here. There's just a different attitude difference for them. Mm -hmm. I do one of the exercises with my students where there's two characters, and I want them to do on the same take two different voices. I want it to try to sound like two different actors. Now, a lot of actors don't have a range of voices, and yet they're still very castable, right? Um, and I've seen many students do very good just by changing the attitude and coming from a different direction of that, that particular character. So even though it's the same voice, you would swear it's two different actors who just have a similar range, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And what do Krillo Sensei, or what does Krillo and what does Coral Sensei think about Buddy Cast? Well, Koro Sensei loves it because it gives you a chance to educate people, and he's all about education. Um, the only thing is, I think it would really spice this show up is that if the guest were able to try to kill you sometime during this interview, and then it would be perfect. <laughs> Okay. What about Krillin? Krillin? Oh, he'd be, he'd be kind of... Krillin would be kind of like uh, a little nervous. Like, uh, is, how many, is this is live? Oh, okay. Um, hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a, you know, a martial artist. I don't uh, do TV stuff. Hi, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> that That's awesome. Now, buddy, I got two more questions for you to make this an official buddy kiss. This is how I stamp okay. my episodes, basically. The first one is brought to me by our buddy Jonas Kane at hashtag positivity. He wants to know, in your own words, what does it mean to be someone's buddy? What it means to be someone's buddy? Mm-hmm. I think, well, I mean, buddy, buddy to me is more like a, a general term, like brother. You know, it's like where we consider everyone on this planet part of our family, you know? And so a buddy is like, uh, you know what? I'm relating to you, buddy, because uh, you're just, you're another one of my brothers, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little different than friend or confidant and things like that, because you don't necessarily have to confide and trust in a buddy, but you recognize a spiritual brotherhood. Brilliant. I like I have, well, I have another question I want to add in here. Where can our buddies find you, like through social media, through any platform mm -hmm. uh well you can find me uh uh sunny straight on facebook you can find me at sunny straight on twitter and also on instagram is at sunny straight and recently i've like three days ago i got on tiktok at sunny straight as well nice and do you do um i almost forgot the word there cameos too oh uh, yeah i've done quite a few cameos yeah nice nice and now, buddy, we've come to what we call the ultimate buddy cast buddy question. You ready for this one? Absolutely. What is your advice to anyone who wants to be a voiceover actor? Get training. Get if there's like tons of us or uh, voice actors who are teaching classes. If I was in your shoes and just starting out as an actor, I would take everybody's class. Because not only you're, you're getting different perspectives and approaches to doing this job, which is really going to help you in, increase your arsenal, but also you're getting seen. You're getting seen by people in the industry, and that is a good thing to have. Um, but also, don't put all your eggs in your first audition. You know, like let's say you finally get an audition at Crunchyroll, right? And you don't get cast, and you're devastated. Don't be. Auditions mean nothing. OK, Monica Rial is my favorite voice actor. She has got an incredible range that no one can touch. And she's an amazing actor. She can emote. She can she can be in the moment and, and, and like nobody's business. Right. And yet I've turned her down in auditions at least three times and not because she sucked. She's brilliant every time she does something. It's just it wasn't quite what I was going for for that character or I've got another character already cast and her voice and his, I think would be better with another person playing off of it. There's millions of reasons. It does not mean you suck. Your job as an actor, especially when you start out is to audition. That's your job, not to act, to audition. You audition for one thing and then you forget about it and move on to something else. You keep auditioning. A friend of mine uh, does nothing but commercial work in California and he get cast like twice a year but he auditions every day. But those two uh, casting he get, that pays for all of his bills for the whole year. So your job is to audition, 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 audition. And don't just audition for anime, audition for everything. And, and do plays, get into community theater. Almost every town has a community theater and nothing is gonna teach you more about how to move audiences than being in front of an audience and moving them, right? 
Mm-hmm. When you make a room of 30, 300 people laugh and cry and stuff like that, it becomes instinctive to you how to do that anywhere. Mm-hmm. Would you say the same for like open mics and like comedy even? Absolutely. I mean, we've got like some of many of our greatest actors like uh, Mike McFarland and Chris Rager. I mean, they they just had they did like improv comedy. To, they were a part of an improv comedy troupe. Um, they come from different places. Anything that's I would say anything artistic contributes, but it's more than that. Anything you experience in life contributes to you as an actor. All of the growth and understandings you have over years. If you took a break from acting for five years, but you went through some like major hardship or whatever and got over it, when you went back to acting, suddenly you will be better. Love the advice. Well, buddy, thank you so, so much for stopping on Buddy Cast, for taking the time to talk to us, and most importantly, for being a buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Yes, your friendship was truly appreciated when you came to Erie. I'm glad I got the chance to talk to you. I know we've been back and forth, back and forth, Mm -hmm. but we finally settled on a date, and I'm glad I got the chance to speak with you. Well, my wife and I really loved having dinner with you. That was nice. Oh, that was awesome, and I thank you for that as well. That That was a lot of fun. You guys were great to chat with, so... It was well, good chatting with you, buddy, and yes. much success to this buddy cast and keep selling that furniture. I will. I will. And I got a favor to ask you before we end this show. First okay. off, please know that you're always welcome back on this show, no matter what. Thank you. This is everything you ever want to promote or anything. You know who to call. And secondly, the favor I have to ask you, whatever you do today, tomorrow, next week, next month, even next year, please, for me, Go be someone's buddy. I always am. You always are. All righty. For all my buddies out there, this is my buddy, Sonny Straight. Please look him up on social media. Look up his work. Go watch an episode of Dragon Ball Z. I'm your host, Nick Sorensen. We'll catch you all next time here on everybody's favorite show, Buddy Cast. Well, the days are going fast, buddy, buddy, we Got to make them last, buddy, buddy, before they've all gone past, buddy, buddy, tune in to Buddy Cats. Don't be lonely, make it, buddy, here on Buddy Cats.